6 a.m., December 21st, 1968. The floodlit Apollo Saturn 503 space vehicle is poised like a giant white dart on pad A of Launch Complex 39 at the John F. Kennedy Space Center. While searchlights reach up from the pad into the star-filled sky, three astronauts, Colonel Frank Borman, Captain James Lovell, and Major William Anders wait inside the Apollo 8 command module for the climactic moment when the six million pound rocket will lift from the ground. The manned spacecraft's target for the first time in history will be the moon. T-minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, we have ignition sequence start. I'm James Lovell. I was a naval officer and also a test pilot and finally NASA astronaut in the period of 62 through 73. My life was quite varied. I was born in Ohio. My father died though when I was young and essentially uh, my life consisted basically in the early years, uh, living with my mother, who was a secretary, my uh, early childhood was one of survival. When I was growing up, Charles Lindbergh uh, made his famous uh, flight across the Atlantic, and this was the inspiration for a lot of young boys growing up in the 30s. I was very much interested in aviation flying. I built you know, model airplanes, uh, solid ones, and ones I tried to fly. When I got out of uh, college, I hoped uh, that I would become uh, a, either a naval aviator or get involved in aviation. I was born in Gary, Indiana in 1928. Uh, at the age of uh, around five or six, I contracted uh, a mastoid and sinus uh, problem. So my parents, uh, really at the beginning of the depression, in the height of the depression, sold out in uh, Indiana and moved to Arizona where the doctors uh, said that I would have a chance of recovery. As a uh, youth, I had no interest in space and. Uh, and rockets. While my friends were reading Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers, I was reading Smiling Jack and, and the Red Eagle. I, I was uh, totally involved both in my, my memory and my aspirations with airplanes. This is Major William Anders, United States Air Force, NASA astronaut. I'm Bill Anders. I was born in uh, Hong Kong, China. My father was number two. 
officer, the executive officer of the USS Panay, picking up uh, people who were trying to escape the uh, Sino-Japanese uh, war. We happened to be in Nanking when uh, the Japanese bombed the ship. The captain was taken out with the first bomb. My dad, who was gunnery officer, took over. And even though it got him a Navy Cross, uh, it didn't save the ship, and eventually they had to abandon it. And he was uh, pretty badly wounded. Uh, we went to San Diego where he spent uh, several months connected to the San Diego Naval Hospital. So he was actually retired, much to his disappointment, and uh, put in the reserves, but almost immediately uh, called back in when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. We spent the balance of the war in San Diego, where I went to, to grammar school. Perhaps the first or second year in high school, I happened to come across a pamphlet that was written in 1913 by a, a fellow, a professor called Robert Goddard. His title was A Method of Reaching Extreme Altitudes. It was a story about how to use liquid fuel rocket technology to get into high altitudes uh, for exploration of the upper atmosphere. I uh, didn't understand half of the book or the pamphlet, but it got me really interested. And so towards the last part of my high school education, I started with some friends building rockets. Uh, we thought we would try to build a liquid fuel rocket, but we soon found out that was impossible. Uh, but we did build some solid rockets using mailing tubes, uh, a combination of uh, potassium nitrate, charcoal, and uh, sulfur, I think it was, which turns out to be the ingredients of gunpowder. I started building model airplanes with my dad's help. I eventually graduated to uh, gas-powered model airplanes. And then uh, when I was 15, I worked, uh, I don't know how many jobs in order to get enough uh, money to fly on the, uh, get a lesson or two on a weekend. And in 1944 or 45, I sold it in a tailor craft. My uh, first aviation experience, first flight in an airplane, was after my dad retired after the war. We went to a small town in uh, southeast Texas. And I remember one day going by this uh, cattle field, and here was a biplane airplane parked out in the field. And they had a sign on the fence, uh, biplane rides at $15. Well, that was big money in those days. But my dad said, hey, would you like to do that? Well, sure. We went out and uh, took off, and uh, he asked me if I'd like to do a loop. I didn't know any better, so I said, sure. So we did a loop, and it impressed me that he was relatively close to the ground. To make a long story short, we flew around a little bit, landed, I enjoyed it, and uh, went to school. And that afternoon, coming back, coming up to the same field, here was his airplane with its nose buried about two feet into the, into the pasture. And I guess the guy had been too, too low and uh, killed the passenger and the pilot. I wanted to be a pilot, and I tried to join the Air Force. The last thing they needed was pilots. You know, all the people were 
coming home from World War II, they had more products than they know what to do with. I, so then I decided, well, I'll, I'll be an aeronautical engineer. And there was a draft on, but I volunteered for induction on the theory I'd serve 18 months and then get the GI Bill and I could get an education that way. This is Camp Buckner, West Point summer training site, where each year cadets of the United States Military Academy who have just finished their plebe year engage in a program of planned military activities. I graduated from West Point in 1950 and reported into uh, Perrin Air Force Base in Sherman, Texas to start basic flying training in a T-6 airplane. From there, I went to uh, Williams Air Force Base and was uh, appointed a, a pilot on the 4th of August, 1951 and, uh, at Williams Air Force Base in Chandler, Arizona. Towards the end of my high school days, I uh, had two choices. And the first thing, my, my mother wanted me to get uh, my education all at once. And uh, so I applied to the United States Naval Academy. Uh, but when I got my uh, card back, or the information back from the academy, it turned out that I was third alternate. So I wrote to the American Rocket Society, and I got a very nice letter back from them said that uh, rocketry uh, as a career is just starting. I would suggest you apply to uh, colleges like uh, MIT and Caltech. I'm sure you'll be successful. Well, <laughs> there wasn't any money for colleges. In those days, uh, we didn't have uh, student loans like we do today. And consequently, my career looked pretty bleak. And then a door of opportunity. The Navy, after World War II, found out that most of the naval aviators didn't want to make the Navy their career. And consequently, all these naval aviators were going back into civilian life. And so the Navy Department set up a program, a program to get more naval aviators into the service. I applied immediately and I was accepted. I went to the University of Wisconsin for two years in a mechanical engineering course. And when I was finished there, I was sent down to Pensacola and I was starting my naval training. Suddenly, I got from the Navy Department a set of orders that if I was still wanted to go to the Naval Academy, I should report to the Naval Academy. And consequently, I dropped my career at that time in naval aviation. And I went to the Naval Academy at Annapolis, started all over again as a plebe. In 1950, the Korean War happened. And a lot of my contemporaries that went through what we call the Holloway program that, that I was in originally, uh, went to see, so got their wings, were in the war itself and never got back to their last two years of college. So very fortunately, my mother was right, get your education while you can. Well, since my father uh, was a career naval officer, I had always assumed that I would follow in his footsteps and uh, become a, uh, a naval officer. I got accepted to the Naval Academy and went away as a plebe. We went on cruises in the summer, and the second cruise as a midshipman was on an aircraft carrier. I remember almost the very first day, pilot uh, missed the wires. It was a straight deck carrier. All the, the other airplanes were up in the front. He missed the wires and crashed into about six other airplanes. 
which they just pushed over the side. One day, the head of the uh, Marine Reserve Squadron, squadron commander, came out in uh, his gullwing Corsair. Looks over and uh, revs the engine up and it gives the okay or the salute or whatever they do, and off he goes. Well, as he went down the catapult, this wing came up. And I remember uh, looking over at this, uh, he was just sitting in the cockpit, but I thought, well, he'll be picked up. So we went by and the uh, ship missed him. And by the time the helicopter was close, the, uh, his airplane sunk and he never got out. The uh, mortality rate that they had on that cruise, uh, uh, wrecking airplanes, uh, I'm thinking, do we really want to do this? Maybe I would be better off in the Air Force uh, where they had 10,000 feet of uh, nice concrete to land and take off on. As a result of intensive work by research institutes and designing bureaus, the first artificial Earth satellite in the world has now been created. This first satellite was today successfully launched in the USSR. According to preliminary information, the carrier... It's hard for people to realize now the impact that had on, on the American psyche. Because here were the Russians sending over every 90 minutes a... Uh, a satellite over our heads, the first one that had ever been launched. And I, I started to uh, rethink my priorities as far as the Air Force went, because I hadn't had any combat time, although I'd taught in the fighter weapons school. So I applied to go to the Air Force test pilot school, and I was accepted. We got back in the car and drove to Edwards Air Force Base, and I, uh, I went into the test pilot school at Edwards. We were doing zoom flights in, in the F-104 uh, to get up high enough to give some people some idea of what zero G was like in an extended period of time and also what it was like to, uh, to control an airplane in circumstances that they'd never done before. We were usually around 30, 32,000 feet up to Mach 2 and then pull up into a 45 or 50 degree climb about 65,000 feet, as I recall, the afterburner blew out. About 75 or 70,000 feet, you had to turn the engine off because it got too hot, you shut the engine off. So you floated over the top, and we were, we're getting up around 90, 91,000 feet, then came back down, uh, relit the engine, and landed. Well, one of the times I was going out of a Mach 2, Uh, all of a sudden, uh, I had a, an explosion in the airplane. My immediate reaction was to bail out, so I reached for the uh, for the ejection handle. But then I remember I'm going that fast, so I was pretty certain that I didn't have a catastrophic failure in the back there because I still had hydraulics. And uh, so I started it and ran it for about two minutes, got enough thrust, shut it off, and uh, dead sticked and the, the uh, landed on the dirt at Edwards. Uh, which was uh, an exciting time. I went into a naval aviation training, graduated in February of 1954, and I was assigned to a team. We had a plane called the Banshee, the F2H Banshee. We were assigned to a carrier called the Shangri-La. The skipper of the ship decided that he wanted to have a combat air group flying over the task force. So I was the first person off at night.
went ahead of the carrier for about three or four minutes, made my 180 turn, came back only at 1,500 feet. I had made it special so that as a night fighter pilot, I had a light that I had built on the knee board during the trip from the U.S. to Japan. And I plugged in the wire to the receptacle, and then I turned on the switch. And when I did that, I must have blew a circuit breaker because every light in my instrument panel in the cockpit went out. And I'm at 1,500 feet. I pulled out a little pen light in my suit put it in my mouth, but it could shine on only one instrument at a time. So I very carefully turned around, still at 1,500 feet, which you should never do in a jet airplane. Uh, and I was coming back and uh, trying to see if I could find the carrier. I did see on the surface of the water a shimmering trail that was going on. It was sort of a phosphorescent thing. And then it dawned on me that perhaps that was the algae that was being churned up by the screws of a large ship. And so as I got to that, I followed it, made the turn to the right, looked at it down, followed it. And sure enough, as I came up at 1,500 feet, I could see the running lights of two airplanes circling this, this uh, darkened ship. Still no lights in my cockpit and we're coming down now at 500 feet, and I could hear them as they were landing one by one, but then we went down to 125 feet. Suddenly, when I looked down at my radar altimeter, and it was going past 20 feet, that scared me half to death. I pulled full power on the airplane, gained back up to 500 feet, made another turn around the carrier, on the carrier, my hook got the last cable, came to a screeching halt, blew two tires, but I got down that carrier. I eventually made 107 night landings, learned my lesson from the first one, and became a competent night fighter pilot. When I graduated from pilot train, the Air Force, I was sent to uh, interceptors. These are aircraft that are generally lightweight, and uh, we were able to climb rapidly in order to intercept a, uh, a Soviet bomber. One uh, day, uh, I got scrambled along with my wingman. We were sent to a place about 40 miles off the eastern shore of Iceland, uh, well beyond our normal range. It turned out to be a Bear Bomber, a six-engine uh, counter-rotating turboprop aircraft, which is still flying uh, even today. But as we came up alongside, I came alongside to get their number. Uh, my wingman stayed out to shoot them down in case they shot at me. As I approached, their quad 23-millimeter uh, uh, cannon tracked me all the way in. Came up alongside, and the crew the Russian crew, who, who knew they were just there to tantalize us, were looking out the window and smiling, and waving. So I gave them the finger. <laughs> and I thought, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I'll get into trouble. Coming up alongside a armed, uh, probably not nuclear arm, but at least machine gun armed uh, bear bomber uh, was a bit of a puckering experience, but it was, uh, in retrospect, kind of surprising to see their crews uh, at the windows smiling and waving. I've always thought you're known more by your enemies than you are by your friends, and so our enemies in those days, uh, in my view, were much more worthy than some of the friends, so-called friends we joined up with later for the domino theory and uh, I found it even more interesting as time went on and the Berlin Wall came down and we met our Soviet counterparts in the space program they were all pretty nice guys and very much like we were. In 
in 1958, I wanted to become a test pilot. So I applied for test pilot school at Patuxent River, Maryland. I was accepted. Suddenly in 1958, the old NACA, the government agency that helped uh, the aerospace industry, decided that they wanted to maybe put a man into space. Uh, and they redesignated uh, that agency to the NASA. Well, they thought, well, what kind of a person should we put into the spacecraft? They had to be under the age of 35. They had to be a graduate of an engineering school, had also have to graduate from a test pilot school. The Navy and the Air Force submitted about, total, about 140 names. I was one of them. NASA had selected 32 for the physical. They dropped eight, they had 32. I was one of the 32. We took a whole week having physicals. Now this physical, they did things actually, in testing us that were not even necessary to see if we were physically fit for the Mercury program or any other program. Out of the 32 people that they tested over the period of time, I was the only guy to flunk the physical. I think that the Loveless Clinic just had to flunk somebody. They couldn't prove all 32 people because that would make them look bad. And consequently, I was not accepted. I went back to Virginia Beach to start training some of the new pilots coming through on how to operate and fly the Phantom airplane. In the Cold War period, it was mutual assured destruction. So neither side was going to do anything, really, in retrospect, to uh, upset the, uh, the nuclear apple cart. I was trained uh, as a coal warrior. And uh, even though, looking back, the Cold War seems kind of silly. Its outcome in other wars seemed even more silly. It was a serious time. Dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks should have made clear to us all, as did the Sputnik in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. When Kennedy made his speech that they were gonna put a man on the moon, and that was about two weeks after Alan Shepard made that suborbital 15 minute flight into the Atlantic, I wasn't in the space program yet, but I thought, man, that uh, to do this before the end of the decade, how are they gonna do that? I got a call from the Navy and said that, look, that NASA needed or wanted more pilots and would you be interested in applying again? Well, I said, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Yes, I'd be more than happy to. So the Navy submitted my name one more time. NASA was selecting the second group of astronauts. The first seven had already been selected. They were flying Mercury. Now they were looking for the second group. So I, I had volunteered. I 
passed the physical very nicely. I was then finally selected for what we called the Gemini program. I went in and told uh, Colonel Yeager then, uh, I said, well, Colonel, I got new good news today. He said, what's that, Barman? I said, well, I just been selected to go to NASA. And uh, <laughs> he looked at me and he said, well, Borman, you can just kiss your blank, blank Air Force career goodbye. And he was right. Before I left uh, Virginia Beach to go down, I got a, a set of orders that said, when you arrive at Houston, uh, get yourself some transportation over there and check into the Rice Hotel. Now, this is somewhat still secretive, so don't use your regular name. Say you're Max Peck, and the hotel will, will give you a whole room and they'll know all about it. Unpacking them for a while and thinking what to do, and suddenly the phone rings, and a fellow on the line says, who are you? And I said, I'm Max Peck. He says, no, you're not, because I'm Max Peck. And I said, well, I don't know. There's an awful lot of Max Pecks here, but I'm Max Peck. Well, that turned out to be uh, Ed White. Other people were checking in, the other nine. And, and we all looked at each other, and I recognized Pete Conrad. and. Jim McDivitt was there, and Frank Warman was there. And so that's how we all got started uh, in the Gemini program. I decided that uh, be being a uh, interceptor pilot for the rest of my career was uh, not that challenging. So I uh, thought I'd apply for test pilot school and went and uh, seek the advice of uh, Chuck Yeager. He recommended that I apply to go and get a, uh, a graduate degree, uh, which I did. In the meantime, uh, NASA uh, put out a release for a third group of astronauts. So I was driving home from work one Friday evening, listening to the radio, and uh, NASA the announcer came over with the uh, new NASA selection criteria when he said that you either had to be a, a, a test pilot or have an advanced degree, I couldn't believe it. So I quickly pulled over the side of the road and waited for the next uh, uh, news cycle. To my surprise, uh, on my birthday in 19... Uh, 63, I got a call from Deke Slayton saying, uh, how'd you like to come to work for us? Which I accepted immediately and totally amazed that I'd made it that far. The next day, I get a call from Chuck Yeager. And he said, well, Bill, he said, I'd keep applying, but uh, you didn't make it this time, uh, but keep applying. Then I made the first of a series of errors. I said, well, Colonel Yeager, uh, I, uh, I got a better offer. What do you mean you got a better offer? And I said, well, I was just, uh, I got a call yesterday from uh, Deke Slayton say I'd been selected for uh, the Apollo program. He said, not possible. I said, what do you mean? He said, because I sat on the screening board for the Air Force and for all those forms that were filled out, we threw every one of them out if they hadn't been test pilots. I said, well, Colonel, it must have been that letter I sent to them uh, in parallel. Well, he went ballistic, saying that uh, you, went a, you made an end run. You went out of channels. This is Chuck Yeager. I mean, out of channels for Chuck Yeager. He spent his life out of channels. But uh, so he said, I'm going to have you thrown out. Well, I uh, immediately called Deke Slayton, the head of the astronaut group not realizing that Deke Slayton and most of the astronauts, the, the Mercury astronauts, did not like Chuck Yeager. So when I told Slayton this, he said, don't worry about it. And I didn't realize that that locked me in since he didn't like uh, Yeager very much. Gemini program in in total 
was designed to prove all of the things that you needed to go to the moon. Number one, you had to be able to last zero in zero G for two weeks. Number two, you had to be able to rendezvous. You had to be able to dock. You had to be able to do extravehicular activity, and you had to have guided reentry. We had to prove all of these things on Gemini, and and Level and I were assigned to uh, Gemini Seven, which was the two-week mission. This is Gemini Launch Control, T minus one minutes and forty-one seconds and counting. The last several minutes of the countdown, all conditions still looking good. As we proceed down to the final moments of the countdown, the launch vehicle, first stage engines will ignite and build up some 430,000 pounds of thrust. When 77% of this thrust is reached, the launch vehicle is released from the pad. All this takes a matter of seconds, some two and a half to three seconds. T minus one minute and counting. T minus one minute and counting. T minus 50. T minus 40 seconds and counting. The astronauts have been alerted that the pre-valves on stage two that permit the oxidizer to come down into the engine compartment will be open. T minus 30 seconds and counting. T minus 25. T minus 20. 15. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. airplanes, but I never have ridden a rocket before. Uh, and I have to tell you, the Gemini uh, booster called the Titan was really a booster to ride. It is a two-stage booster. So the fuel burned out in the, in the booster itself. It got lighter, of course, and that meant it accelerated. First stage burned out. Uh, all those fuel was expended, and we jettisoned it. Then the second stage, Now the second stage was trying to get us all the way up into the proper altitude for being in orbit and the proper speed to get it into circular orbit about 17,500 miles an hour. And as the second stage fuel burned off and we got lighter and lighter and lighter, the G loading got more and more and finally it got up to eight Gs when suddenly the engine shut down and we went inside the spacecraft from eight G's to zero G's. And it was quite a sight, some of the old washers and stuff that was left over by the, by the workmen floated up. When we first separated from the rocket, you looked down, uh, I frankly thought it was like flying a, a fighter airplane, but a very high altitude. You could see, uh, of course, the clouds below you and the oceans, uh, airports with the runways laid out, and you see railroads and uh, freeways. And it was very much like flying at very high altitude in an in a airplane, except more so. Gemini 7, required Lovell and I to stay in the cockpit of a Gemini capsule, smaller than the front seat of a Volkswagen, for two weeks. I think two weeks in a Gemini capsule, you know, trying to get out of pressure suits, and two weeks with Frank Borman <laughs> is a real challenge. 
Gemini 7 is basically a medical mission. It's the culmination of our efforts to increase or double man's exposure to the spaceflight environment, ending with a 14-day manned space flight. NASA, being run by engineers, kind of looked at the astronauts as a piece of equipment uh, that was uh, put on a, uh, on a shelf, and when the time came, they would take it off the shelf, stick it into a spacecraft, uh, they said, don't touch anything, and then take off, and they would find out just how humans would, would last. Gemini 6 mission was uh, Wally Shira and Tom Stafford. It was gonna be the first rendezvous with an Agena rocket. But uh, unfortunately, the Agena blew up. Why doesn't Gemini 6 then rendezvous with Gemini 7? Because 7 will be up there for two weeks, will give us time to turn around the Gemini 6 booster and the spacecraft to rendezvous with. So that's exactly what happened. Controllers here think they heard uh, Tom Stafford say that he had the spacecraft in sight, the seven spacecraft with its blinking lights, at 12 o'clock high. We have had no uh, conversation via Tanana Reeve at this point. And as Chris Craft observed earlier, the ground has done all it can at this point through computations. It's all up to them now. We're standing by, we'll come back to you when we have additional information. This is Gemini Control, Houston. We'd been up there maybe 11 or 12 days. Uh, Gemini 6 came up, first it looked like a star, eventually it came right up to us, uh, and here was Wally Shaw and Tom Stafford flying within a foot of us. nose to nose, uh, side to side. We found out that flying the two spacecraft using our attitude thrusters was very nice, even though, of course, we didn't have wings, but we had thrusters in zero gravity and in a vacuum of space. Uh, and it was a, a very successful flight. We came to the conclusion that, you know, in Gemini 6, there were two uh, graduate of uh, graduates of the Naval Academy. And in Gemini 7, there was another Naval Academy graduate, Jim Lovell, and uh, Frank Wolverine was a West Pointer. And it was just that time where it's near the uh, Army-Navy game. And so when Gemini 6 went up to rendezvous with us and during the pos position that we were nose to nose, uh, Tom Stafford held up a little plaque that said, Beat Army, I took the picture and it was then known as the highest beat army rally known to man. The re-entry, you fire three retro solid retro rockets that you fire to slow you up enough so that the Earth's gravity would capture you and take you back into a landing. It was like flying a, an instrument landing system on an airplane. 
except instead of making corrections on an airplane, you normally make three to five degrees, you were making 180 degree corrections. That really set the Apollo program back. They signed Frank Borman to be the major main astronaut interface with the uh, accident investigation. And Frank basically disappeared where this command module was being assembled and uh, found all kinds of problems. We found that there had been very slipshod workmanship at North America on the spacecraft. We were given carte blanche to find out what the problem was and fix it. Revealing time. I've been waiting around, hoping to fly on Gemini, realizing that uh, being a non-test pilot and engineer uh, put me sort of near the bottom of the totem pole. So when I was informed by Frank Borman uh, that I would be on his crew as a lunar module pilot, I was uh, quite satisfied. Finally, going to get a chance to uh, fly and uh, maybe even land on the moon. Jim Lovell and Bill Anders and I were out at North American with a spacecraft, spacecraft 104. Our mission was Apollo 9, and we were to fly basically the Apollo 8 mission, uh, which was a, a rendezvous mission with the lunar module 
Uh, but instead of doing it in low Earth orbit, we were going to do it out into it. I believe it was an 8,000 mile orbit. I got a phone call. I was in the spacecraft. They got me out and said, Deke Slayton wants to talk to you. So I went over and talked to him, told him, hi, Deke, what can I? He said, uh, you come back, to, <laughs> come back to Houston. And I said, Deke, I'm busy. I can't come back. He said, come back to Houston right away. Get an airplane and come back right away. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, he said, come on in and close the door. I closed the door and he told me that uh, the CIA had determined that the Russians were going to try a lunar flyby before the end of 1968. And he wanted to know if uh, we would object to changing our mission and taking just the command module and going uh, around the moon before the Russians did. When I learned that we were going to lose the lunar module and be accelerated uh, for a circumlunar flight, I was quite disappointed because I knew that without the lunar module background, if I ever flew again, it would be as a command module pilot and not land on the moon. I had made two flights around the Earth. I had done a lot with Gemini. It was the first small flight. Of course, Apollo would be a new challenge, but the fact that we'd be the first people to uh, go to the moon, I was very excited. We're gonna change your, your launch date to December. Well, originally it was in February. We're gonna move you up. You'll have to take uh, McDivitt's command module, and McDivitt will take yours, and they'll just switch time and numbers. McDivitt will be now number nine, and, uh, and you'll be Apollo 8. The final objective of uh, President Kennedy's uh, talk back in 61 was that we were going to land somebody on the surface of the moon and bring it back safely before the end of the decade. But in reality, to do that, you needed a pathfinder. You needed someone to really work out the majority of the problems of going to the moon and that was Apollo 8. We had a, a great deal to do and only four months to do it in because this was August when we learned that our mission had been changed and we were supposed to launch in December. Blinders on, how do we make Apollo 8 work? Look back at 1968, of course, we were so uh, in, involved in training and uh, learning about the Apollo 8 spacecraft and getting ready for the flight. We had kind of forgotten what the tenure of the uh, 
uh, of the United States was in at that time. The protesters have been prevented from marching toward the amphitheater. The clashes have occurred five miles away in downtown Chicago, outside the Democrats' headquarters hotel. There was serious violence there last night, and Jack Lawrence reports. They jabbed nightsticks into stomachs and skulls, battering demonstrators and bystanders who were hopelessly trapped on sidewalks, in panic with nowhere to run. Kennedy had been assassinated, Martin Luther King had been assassinated. Things were building up. You know, it's strange, but, and I suppose I shouldn't uh, even admit this, but we were so absorbed in the uh, space program and so were oriented toward beating the Russian and, and making certain that things went well, that it didn't have a, a large impact on me. so much Cold Warriors on our own. The, the, uh, the Cold War had three battles. Korea, we tied. Vietnam, we lost. Space, we won. And my Cold War war was in space. Saturn V is the world's uh, most powerful, successful rocket. The Saturn V never had a failure on a manned mission. It was really a, uh, a marvel of engineering and, and uh, production. Uh, it was gigantic, 365 feet tall. Weighed uh, six million pounds, developed seven and a half million pounds of thrust. It was really a beast, three stages. It had been tested several times, each test having some anomalies. five big engines on the first stage, five smaller engines on the second stage, and then one engine on the third stage. And the time you lifted off till you were in orbit was about 11 minutes. Frank Borman was the uh, uh, sort of the rocket expert, and uh, when he said it, it was okay with him, that was okay with me. As the time it got close to launch, and we figured the launch would be December 21st, 
1968, that was a good uh, window to get to the moon, and we're still worried about what the Soviets were going to do. Uh, the last night uh, we spent uh, in the quarters, doing final lookings at uh, at charts and maps. Did one last look at the, the chart that showed the uh, lunar topography and the course that we're going to go around the moon. Woke up in the morning. My favorite uh, breakfast is bacon and eggs, so I had bacon and eggs. <laughs> sort of the last meal. <laughs> Give me your choice. But uh, then we went and suited up. Apollo sat on launch control at 3 hours, 21 minutes, 27 seconds and counting. The spacecraft test conductor now has given a go for crew departure. We expect that astronauts Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders will be coming out in a matter of a few minutes. This is launch control. Dick Prophet has advised that the prime crew is now uh, leaving the suit room and we should expect them downstairs ready to uh, board their transfer van in just a matter of uh, a short time. First Frank Borman, away from uh, Frank, also Jim Lovell and the final man aboard the transfer van, astronaut Bill Anders. They are being joined by two suit technicians, and we expect the door in the transfer van to be closed shortly. Astronaut uh, Deke Slayton, director of flight crew operations, also aboard the transfer van. He'll drop off here at the uh, control center. The transfer van now departs. We went down into the van, and uh, the van took us uh, to the uh, to the booster to the launch area. It's kind of it's kind of eerie to go down to that big Saturn V on launch day. It's loaded with about five and a half million pounds of high explosive. The Apollo 8 crew now on the way to the pad. Our countdown is go at this time. Still aiming for a planned liftoff time at 7:51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is launch control. As we got to the gantry and went up. Only the checkout people, or three, about three nervous checkout people, were anywhere near that vehicle with us. Everybody else was a comfortable three and a half miles away in the launch control center. All three astronauts now getting aboard the first of two elevators that will take them to the 320-foot level and their Apollo 8 spacecraft. Now being joined by two suit technicians, gate in the elevator closing, and we expect it will be going up shortly. We expect they'll be up at the 320-foot level and the Apollo 8 spacecraft in a matter of minutes from this time. When I got on the elevator and went up 36 stories to the uh, spacecraft, and I do remember walking on the gantry over to the spacecraft from the elevator. It was a long way down there. You got, to, you could see then the size of that uh, of that launch vehicle was in, was really. Uh, Impressive. Astronauts Frank Foreman and Bill Anders now going across swing arm nine, the top swing arm at the launch pad, and of course the access arm that attaches to the Apollo spacecraft. I remember looking down through the grating and thinking, uh, boy, this is a big rocket. Foreman and Anders now have arrived in the White Room. The spacecraft commander, astronaut Frank Foreman, is now aboard the Apollo 8 spacecraft. And Bill Anders is now boarding the spacecraft. Astronaut Jim Lovell, the third member of the crew, now is aboard the spacecraft. Has closure at 5.34 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Strapped in, uh, and they closed the hatch, and we waited. Sort of uh, quiet uh, during that period, because in the meantime, uh, lots of people started coming out on the, uh, on the beaches, and uh, everything was set up. Uh, the, 
people were getting gathered in the stands. The uh, NASA PR guy through loudspeakers were telling everybody what was happening in the countdown at that time. And meanwhile, we heard nothing. Everything was quiet in there. We were left alone for the final countdown of uh, the Saturn to launch. The Apollo 8 uh, crew standing by, spacecraft commander Frank Foreman, Jim Lovell, Bill Anders. We were out there doing our job, and here was our chance to uh, make a major uh, strike for freedom in the Cold War. Propellants pressurized at this time as we come up on the 60-second mark on a flight to the moon. First flight on the Saturn V, first to leave the Earth, so there, you know, there really wasn't much to wring your hands about. T-minus 60 seconds and counting. T-minus 60 seconds and counting. The vehicle now is completely pressurized. I thought we had uh, about one chance in three of having a successful mission. T-minus 50 seconds and counting. We have the power transfer. We're now on the flight batteries within the launch vehicle. Launch vehicle almost came alive. As they opened different valves, you could hear fuel gurgling and and uh, swayed a little bit in the, in the uh, breeze. 35 seconds and counting. We'll lead up to an ignition sequence start at 8.9 seconds. This will lead up as we build up the thrust. The biggest stress for a pilot is screwing up in public. Almost rather die than screw up in public. And so we were mainly severely motivated not to screw up. T-minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, we have ignition sequence start. When the countdown came to zero, uh, all hell broke loose. Mighty F-1 engines uh, kicked in. Uh, we were held down for a second or two to check them out and then released. Hold off, uh, the clock is running. Roger, clock. The, the one distinguishing thing that I can say about a Saturn V launch was it was noisy. And the Saturn V is really an old man's booster because I don't believe we got more than six Gs. So it wasn't a rapid acceleration to begin with. It was quite slow. The people are watching that vehicle lift off and then suddenly sort of dance away from the gantry because the vehicle's being controlled by the four outside F1 engines that are gimbaled. And so the guidance system gimbals them to allow the spacecraft to move a little bit away from the gantry and then start to take off. Dark 
clear. 13 seconds. Roger, this program. Roger. How do you hear, Houston? Right clear. I only got scared twice on the flight, and the launch was one of them. And I thought, this is a bad way to start. We've simulated everything we could think of, and we didn't simulate the launch that was unbelievably uh, violent. Mark, mode one, Bravo, Apollo 8. Mode one, B. One minute out, Mike Collins tells the crew we're looking good. It was so noisy, uh, you couldn't think, you couldn't speak. If something happened, you couldn't communicate. Sources show the second stage is burning perfectly. Two minutes, 51 seconds into the mission. The, the staging from first stage to second stage particularly was extremely abrupt. When the first stage fuel is expended, we're pulled down about 5 Gs because as the first days get slighter, the faster we're going. I felt like I was being catapulted through the uh, instrument panel. On the Saturn V, everybody was a rookie. Everything was, was exactly perfect. We got it, we found ourselves in orbit 11 minutes later. Then we had to go around once and a half uh, in Earth orbit before we relit the S4B third stage and got injected out to the velocity that would allow us to escape Earth gravity and go to the moon. afraid that in that orbit and a half, the ground was obviously going over every system on board, and afraid if they found any anomaly at all, you know, they were going to inject us toward the moon with uh, some sort of concern about a system. So I was afraid that we would end up spending 11 days in Earth orbit, uh, and uh, I was relieved when uh, I heard Mike Collins uh, say, uh, Apollo 8, you're go for TLI, go for translunar injection. Apollo 8, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. Apollo 8, you are go for TLI. Over. Roger, understand. We're go for TLI. Well, once you add the velocity that you already have in orbit, but you add the velocity necessary to escape it, you knew there was no coming back. Wait, coming up on 20 seconds to ignition. Mark it, and you're looking very good. As the spacecraft came around the Earth, on the far side of the Earth, away from the moon, we lit the third stage a second time, and they gave us, that gave us the proper velocity and on the proper course to coast all the way to the moon. So we knew we were on our way, and uh, our fate was now in the hands of uh, the uh, physicists and, uh, and computers. Fast 40. 
in my life. But this year's what it is. This is only nine. Nine. Eight. Seven. Four. Three. Two. Light on. Ignition. 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 Houston, you're looking good, right down the old center line. Roger, Paul. I'd like to tell you it required a great deal of skill and piloting ability, and, and we cheated death, but the fact is it worked perfectly. We came into sunlight. We had to disengage from the third stage, separate. The idea was to turn the spacecraft 180 degrees and go back to the third stage. Every flight to the moon after Apollo 8, we'd have a lunar module, and the lunar module was tucked into the end of the third stage. What a view. Looks pretty good, huh? We stepped, Houston, we got the 4B right. Roger, Paul A. Roger, we're uh, loud and clear. We're taking pictures of the S4B. Uh, the uh, post separation sequence is, is uh, completed, and we seem to have a high gain. We stayed closer to the S4B than I liked. Uh, the S4B was now unpowered, but it was slowly beginning to tumble and venting, spewing out uh, all the unburned fuel. It was a, a remarkable sight. I said, looked like a, a giant lawn sprinkler. Boy, it's uh, starting to vent now, blowing down. The S4B is really venting. Roger, well, understand, uh, that is a uh, supposedly a non-propulsive vent. That is a non-propulsive vent, but it's pretty spectacular. Uh, we see the uh, Earth now almost as a uh, disk. Good show, get a picture of it. We are. Phil Conrad, he lost his record. We have a beautiful, beautiful view of Florida now. We can see the Cape uh, just the point. Roger. And at the same time, we can see Africa. West Africa is beautiful. What window are you looking at? The center window. Good. We slithered out of our spacesuits with some help from each other and uh, stowed them under the seats. Uh, then had an opportunity to uh, look out the window and uh, see the Earth uh, as a full Earth for the first time. And that was a beautiful sight. Well, Mike. I can see the entire Earth now out of the center window. I can see Florida, Cuba, Central America, the whole northern half of Central America, in fact, all the way down through Argentina and down through uh, Chile. When we first left the Earth and the and we were looking back at the Earth as we were going out, and the uh, we started out at a very high velocity and slowly we we're slowing down. But I could see the Earth then get smaller and smaller and smaller as we got away. Uh, it's some, it looked like uh, being in the back seat of an automobile as you go through a tunnel and you're looking out the back window and you see the tunnel shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink until uh, you, you know it gets smaller and smaller. Are you receiving television now? Apollo 8, uh, Houston, uh, we just got it. You aren't getting it. Uh, we had a relatively primitive uh, black and white television camera. Frank didn't want to take it. He didn't. He basically didn't want to take anything that would might detract from the mission. I was uh, wrong because I had uh, suggested or advocated not taking a television camera at all on the spacecraft. 
But I was wrong, and I was overruled by my smarter people in, the, in NASA. And the people deserved to understand and see and be a, as much a part of it as they could be. This transmission is coming to you approximately halfway between the moon and the Earth. We've been uh, 31 hours, about 20 minutes into flight. We have about uh, less than 40 hours left to go to the moon. Jim is busy working, preparing lunch. Uh, Bill is uh, playing cameraman right now, and I am uh, about to take a uh, light reading on the Earth. We all feel fine. It was a very exciting ride on that big Saturn, but it worked perfectly. And we're looking forward now, of course, till the day after tomorrow when we'll be uh, just 60 miles away from the moon. Happy birthday, mother. Hello, Houston. This is Apollo 8. We have a television camera pointed directly at the Earth now. Okay, uh, we're just picking it up at 3 o'clock on our screen. The bright blob on the upper right of the screen is the Earth. It's looking better. You're, you're holding up about 1 to 2 o'clock. Looking better. Give us a little more in that same direction. You're down at 3 o'clock now. We see about half of what you see. That, you're going the right way. You're going the right way. A little bit more. A little bit more. Ah, uh, whoa, stop right there. Mark, it's right in the center of our screen. And just hold her, hold her steady. It's really looking good. Houston, what you're seeing is the Western Hemisphere. Looking at the top is the North Pole. In the center, just lower to the center, is South America. All the way down to Cape Horn. I can see Baja, California, and uh, the southwestern part of the United States. For colors, the waters are all a sort of a royal blue. Clouds, of course, are uh, bright white. The reflection off the Earth is uh, is much greater than the moon. Uh, the land areas are generally a brownish. All right, you're all looking at yourselves as seen from 180,000 miles out in space. Mike, what I uh, keep imagining is that if I'm a, a lonely traveler from another planet, what I think about the Earth from this altitude, whether I think it'd be inhabited or not. Don't see anybody waving, is that what you're saying? All right, well, we're seeing uh, the entire uh, Earth now, including the, the Terminator. Well, I'm just kind of curious uh, whether I would land on the blue or the brown part of the Earth. I hope we land in the blue park. So are we, babe. Jim is always for land landing. I took what to me was the most notable picture of the flight, showing the Earth against a uh, dark velvet background of space, about the size of your fist at arm's length. One lunar distance seems like a long way but it's hardly anywhere in space. Indeed, 10 lunar distances are hardly going anywhere in space. And at 10 lunar distances, fist gets down to a one-tenth size marble. At 100 lunar distances, where you're not even close to Mars yet, you're down now to a tiny little sand grain. And 500 lunar distances, you can't really see the Earth with the naked eye physically. The idea that uh, the Earth was the center of the universe, and therefore, you know, humans were the center of uh, universal civilization, sounded to me like baloney. The more I thought about it, very selfish, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, human-centric, and so uh, that has sort of upset my views on uh, a lot of things that we've taken for granted. Uh, politics, religion, uh, you name it, uh, to think that we're just uh, probably one among millions or billions of uh, centers of intelligence that have existed or maybe even still exist in the universe. Frank uh, is 
being an old Air Force officer and not Navy, he was, uh, he got a, a pretty bad case of, uh, of air sickness. Uh, he gets that way. Gemini, because he was so tied in and so looking so straight, I was sitting next to him that he, if he had it in the very beginning, he overcame it and didn't even tell me. Uh, but he couldn't do that on Apollo because as soon as you got out of that seat, uh, you, you had enough room to move around in and you had to move around to do things. So he got quite ill. This is Apollo Control Houston. Within the last hour, in a private conversation, we've learned that there is some, uh, a little nausea aboard. Frank Borman uh, reported an upset stomach. I remember Lovell and I were up on our couches. And this glob came up. We immediately donned, uh, I put on a, an oxygen mask that was supposed to be saved for only for fire. I said, to hell with that. So I put the mask on. And uh, this thing about that big came floating up. And I thought, boy, oh, that's fascinating. You know, I, I was initially repulsed, but then a physicist in me rose to the occasion. So here was a three dimensional, multicolored, oscillating ball. And uh, both Lovell and I kind of watched it. It was going this way. And then it split. And the laws of conservation momentum, since one piece went that way, the other piece had to go this way, right towards Lovell. So I watched it go, and it splatted like a fried egg on his chest. Uh, that was uh, built up a lot more than it was because, uh, you know, the doctors all of a sudden had a chance to shine. And they go, oh my goodness, we ought to do this, or we ought to do that. If you're in that environment for like the time, your stomach finally says, hey, there's no sense fighting this thing, I'll, I'll go along with it. And that's essentially what happened uh, to Borman. I got over it quite quickly, and I can tell you, if the, if the doctors had threatened or recommended, I get maybe they, I had heard that, that Dr. Burry even recommended that we abort the mission, I, but if that would have happened, we would have had radio failure. I, I, I can guarantee that. Frank, is, is this lunar orbit mission too risky after only one manned Apollo flight? No, Jules, it, as I said before, if I, I, I can honestly say this. If I thought it was too risky, I don't know how the other two people feel, but I wouldn't be on board. We've uh, flown many uh, unmanned Apollos, as you know. We have uh, the, the system history of the Apollo is fantastic and the testing, the redundancy, the uh, quality control and the care that we've made and then the proceed the changes that we've made since the fire. I, th I think it's a safe vehicle. Uh, Apollo 8, this is Houston at 68.04, your goal for LOI. Okay, Apollo 8 is go. Apollo 8, Houston, you're riding the best bird we can find, over. Thank you. Here in Mission Control, uh, we're standing by. There's a, certainly a great deal of anxiety at this moment, as in the next two and a half minutes, we will not talk with the crew uh, for some period of time. As we approached the moon, we, we were in complete darkness. We hadn't seen the moon on the entire trip to the moon. We were upside down and going backwards so that we could fire the rocket to slow us up. One minute, uh, 30 seconds away now from loss of signal as we continue with this flight of Apollo 8. One of the issues that uh, Frank was concerned about, and rightly so, that if they could calculate the trajectory right, they ought to be able to calculate when we would lose signal. Apollo 8, Houston, one minute to LOS, all systems go. Thanks a lot, groups. Yeah, the other side. And sure enough, at the exact time we were supposed to lose radio communications, we lost it. Okay, we got 10 minutes. Well, I'll tell you, gentlemen, that moon is pretty close. Okay, go ahead and start pitch one. One. Y'all one. Got it. Okay. Family man controller clockwise. Clockwise. We fired the engine, and that slowed us down so that we could get and be captured by uh, the moon. Standing by for engine on ignable. Proceed when you get it. Okay. Start your watch when you get ignition. One second, two seconds. All right, how's everything? You got him. Pressure's holding good. All right. 
Everything's good over here so far. Everything's looking good. We went into the shadow of the moon from the sun. Call it the umbra. There is no earth shine. There is no sunshine. And so consequently, when we looked out at the window, all the stars say came out. Suddenly, there were stars everywhere, more stars than you could count. You couldn't recognize the constellations because even the little stars seemed bright. And yet, as I looked back over my shoulder, I saw suddenly the stars disappeared. A black hole and that was the moon. And I must say, at that stage of the game, the hair came up on the back of my neck a little bit, that we were sailing into this uh, black hole. We rolled out the spacecraft, and then we were just getting into uh, where the darkness slipped into the long shadows of the, uh, of the sunlight started to come in. We saw the long shadows of darkness on the moon's craters. Finally, we got into where there was sunshine on the moon, and that's the first time we saw saw the moon itself. Hey, I got the moon. Dang it. Right below us. Okay. It is below us? Yeah. And it's, uh... Oh, my God. Watch out. Look at that. It looks like a big beach down there. Yeah, fantastic. Yep. You know, I still have trouble telling the holes from the front. All right, come on. Here we had gone 240,000 miles, and we were only uh, about 60 or 65 miles above the lunar surface. We are the first people to really see alive these craters, and just 60 miles above the surface, and no atmosphere around the moon, and with the sun shining, things were very, very, very clear. Apollo 8, Houston, over. Go ahead, uh, Houston, Mr. Apollo 8. Very complete, uh, orbit is 160. Point nine by sixty point five. Uh, Apollo eight, Houston. Uh, what does the old moon look like? Sixty miles, over. Okay, uh, Houston. The moon is essentially gray. <laughs> no color. Looks like plaster of Paris. Or uh, sort of a grayish beach sand. We can see quite a bit of detail. Uh, the crater craters are all rounded off. There's quite a few of them. Some of them are newer. Many of them look like, uh, especially the round ones, look like uh, hit by meteorites or projectiles of some sort. Uh, Roger, understand. Good evening. American astronauts Borman, Lovell, and Anders are whirling about the moon on this Christmas Eve, further away from home than man has ever been. It may be lonely for them, so far away, 230,000 miles from their families, but they are busy making history that will loom large as long as there is civilization on Earth. For in their remarkable Apollo 8, they are the explorers who have first transited space and have opened the way for the lunar age. Instead of going around the moon upside down and backwards, Frank uh, repositioned the spacecraft so it was more like driving a car uh, down a road. All right, we're going to roll. Ready? Set. I guess he was turning in my direction because something caught my eye out of, the, uh, out of my window, and I said, hey, look at that, and it turned out to be the Earth coming up over the stark lunar horizon. Yeah, look at that picture over there. Wow, that's great. Hey, don't take that. It's not scheduled. <laughs> you got a color film, Jim? Hand me a roll of color, quick. Oh, man, that's great. Hurry. Where is it? Quick. Let's grab me a color. A color exterior. That one? Yeah, I'm looking for one. C-368. Anything, quick. Hey, I've got it right here. Bill, I got a frame that's very clear right here. Got it? Yep. Thanks. 
several take of them. Take several of them. Here, give it to me. Wait a minute. Let me just get the right setting here. Now, just calm, take, calm down, Bubba. Well, I got a ra Oh, that's a beautiful shot. We had not been programmed uh, for an earth rise. Uh, nobody had said anything about taking pictures of it. Uh, we didn't even have a light meter. What did it really mean as the three of us looked at the earth coming up and finally getting a, a true perspective of where we were, three guys just 240,000 miles from the Earth. Here is this beautiful planet, blue with white clouds, kind of brownish pink continents that you could clearly distinguish. Terribly isolated with a black, black background of, of, of space. I thought, you know, how insignificant we all are. Everybody I ever knew, five billion people could be behind my thumb as I put it up. And I thought how lucky we are that we have a body like that, that uh, is there so that we can live and enjoy it. There were no other points of color in the whole universe except for the Earth. But it was everything that we held dear was back there 240,000 miles away our families, our country, uh, everything. And it was uh, a Christmas Eve. So it was a very nostalgic moment uh, looking back at the earth. We often talk about going to heaven when we die. But in reality, don't we go to heaven when we're born? Because uh, don't we arrive on a, uh, on a body that has the proper mass? Uh, that can contain water and an atmosphere, the very essentials of, of life. And don't we arrive on a body that's just at the right distance from a star that provides the energy, the energy to the Earth, and that energy is what caused life to evolve in the beginning. In some aspects, God has really given us a stage a stage on which to perform. And I think that how this play comes out uh, is really up to us. This is Apollo 8 uh, coming to you live from the moon. Bill Anders, Jim Lovell, and myself have spent uh, the day before Christmas up here uh, doing experiments, taking pictures, and uh, firing our spacecraft engines to maneuver around. The moon is a uh, different thing to each one of us. I think that each one of uh, each one uh, carries his own impressions of what of what he's seen today. I know my own impression is that it's a a vast, lonely, forbidding type existence or expanse of nothing. We are now approaching uh, lunar sunrise, and uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth, and the Earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Can we'd like to get all squared away for TEI here. Can you uh, give us some good words like you promised? Yes, sir. I have a maneuver pad. Uh, I think we'd like to start by dumping the tape. If we could have that, I have your TEI-10 maneuver pad, and then we'll run through a systems brief. 
After we had uh, read from Genesis and we prepared to return to the Earth, on the back side of the moon, we lit the uh, service propulsion engine to accelerate uh, out of lunar gravity. But this time pointing forward in order to accelerate the spacecraft to a velocity that would now tear the, itself away from lunar gravity. If it hadn't worked, we'd be in big trouble. You know, we'd, we'd still be there. Pretty desiccated, but still be uh, uh, monuments to Apollo's failure. Okay, Apollo 8, uh, we have reviewed all your systems. You have a go for TEI. Three minutes, LOS. All systems are go. Over. Roger, thank you, Houston, Apollo 8. He came up with a, a number. I think it was 9922, if I'm not mistaken. And that number essentially said to you, do you really want to make this maneuver? It gave you a little chance to get out of it. If you didn't want to make the maneuver, you could say cancel. And so then, uh, then five seconds later, uh, you know, uh, I, I hit proceed and then it would go. And of course, I, I hesitated after I saw that for a little bit. And uh, of course, Borman gave me the elbow. He said, you know, push the button, push the button. So I pushed the button. And of course, that set up the thing to fire the engine. Christmas Day, they were headed home. As we slowly got closer and closer to the Earth, when everything was fine, we jettisoned the service module. As it took it away, we made a maneuver to make sure we wouldn't get hit by it. Nobody had done a, a re-entry from this high velocity. You had to make certain that you were properly positioned. We had to hit a corridor. I think it was something like six or seven degrees wide. We're making a night re-entry, first night re-entry, first high-speed re-entry, a lot of firsts. Through a set of marks on the commander's window, he could then kind of take a look at when, the, when he would see the moon at a certain time, he would get in his window, that would tell him pretty much that he was on the proper course uh, to come on in and make a landing. I mentioned uh, to uh, Frank and Jim uh, that it looked like the uh, things were getting pink and they said, oh, don't worry, uh, that's just sunrise. These are the experts speaking. Turns out that the reentry from the moon is exciting for anybody. Oh, man, we're getting close. There's no turning back now. Oh, mother of heaven. Is it one? Well, OK, we got to build This is going to be a real ride. Hang on. I've we're never seen a desk ride before. Yeah. Oh, Maggie. O5G. Okay, we got it. EMS Hang on. Point O5G, switch on. O5G, rolling EMS. Right. Okay, gang. And they're building up. We're one, two, three, four, five, six. Anderson, I ever saw. Gemini was never like that, wasn't it, Jim? I'm sure you have never seen anything like it. Jokes that uh, you got him there. 863. Houston, Apollo 8, over. Roger. 
I do. This is a real fire ball. It's looking good. Come on, John Glenn. We're in real good shape, dude. 30K. DLS logic on. Right. DLS auto. Auto. Stand by for RCS disabled. Stand by on the apex cover. Right. The apex cover. There go the drones. Come on. Okay. 20,000. Damn pressure's coming up. 19,000. 15. Stand by with the main with one second. Yep. Can't see it. We should read the main. Okay. We got him? Yeah. Float bag three. Sucker bag is closed. Closed. VHF antenna's recovery, VHF AM simplex. Beacon's going on. Get your light on, it's on. You got the, you got it, Jim. Huh? You got the call, give him a call. Okay. Yes, to Apollo 8, over. Apollo 8, Air Boss 1. Welcome home, gentlemen, and we'll have you aboard in no time. Yeah, when we hit the surface, we must have hit on an uprising swell because we hit so hard that I thought the spacecraft had split open. And I got inundated with water. Uh, we weren't sure where the water came from. I thought at first maybe we had popped a seam or a, a vent valve had opened, but later on I think it was probably condensation from around the environmental control unit that had inundated. We hit so hard that it knocked Frank's finger off the uh, parachute release switch. So the parachutes were released late, and it turned us over. So here we were, floating upside down in the Pacific. And so with pointing in down, all the trash that it collected in the spacecraft and uh, came raining down on our faces in the dark. And I thought this is not a, a great way to end this historic adventure, as if we were in a New York subway that somebody turned upside down and shook. The spacecraft was going up and down and around. It was a very poor boat, uh, a wonderful spacecraft, but a very poor boat. So we were floating out there, pretty rough sea. Uh, poor Frank got sick again. Jim and I were somewhat merciless. We maybe a little mean because we were both Naval Academy graduates and he was a West Point guy. All you did was push another switch and started a compressor, blew up a couple balloons, and the buoyancy of the balloons below the surface flipped us back right upside waited uh, quite a few hours for the sun to come up because the rescue crews uh, were somewhat reluctant to jump in in the dark uh, and there were apparently sharks swimming around the spacecraft and so they had to uh, I think they dispatched a few sharks so that NASA didn't make a release about that but then uh, jumped in and just put a uh, stabilization ring like a big life ring around the spacecraft we op started opening the hatch, and uh, this young man poked his head in and immediately fell backwards. So anyway, we got out, and I noticed there was a strange smell. Turned out to be fresh air. Things had gotten pretty ripe in that spacecraft. This is Apollo Control, Houston. We've just been advised that the hatch of Apollo 8, the hatch is now open. And we, uh, we are advised that the first astronaut is in the helicopter. No more identification than that, just first astronaut in a helicopter. And I kept thinking this has to be the most dangerous part of the flight because whereas we had triple redundancy on most things during the flight, here was this one cable. Second astronaut's on his way up. His second astronaut in the sling and on his way. Right, the third astronaut is in the sling and is being uh, brought up into the helicopter. Recovery 3 has been given permission to land first. And touchdown at uh, 20 minutes after the hour, 11.20 Central Standard Time. Astronaut Foreman and Lovell and Anders standing on the steps, and a great cheer goes up from the 
Sailor is out here on the flight deck. Roaring here. The North American people are in. The room is awash with cigar smoke. Every console operator is displaying a flag at his desk, and I have never seen uh, the degree of this emotional outpouring in any previous mission, including Alan Shepard's. I've seen uh, rallies in locker rooms after championship games. I've seen happy politicians after elections, but I, and none of them do justice to the spirit pervading this room. Someone suggested we've set the American Cancer Society's anti-smoking campaign back uh, several light years. Being the kind of men they are, they certainly have no taste for being heroes. But even in this age of cynicism and skepticism, when we almost don't have any heroes, they may have a hard time escaping. I think Apollo 8 was perhaps, of all the Apollo missions to the moon, uh, was the one that was the most perfect. The least amount of problems. Uh, things worked as planned, uh, and uh, there were no bits of the mission that we didn't know about, we didn't plan for. Uh, for the follow-on uh, lunar landing flights. I think Apollo 8's legacy is really a uh, turning point in the history of exploration uh, from Columbus uh, to Lewis and Clark uh, to Apollo 8. This was the forerunners. This was the people who put their first step forwards into uh, the uh, final frontier. I think it helped to unify the country and to, and to give us some uh, cohesiveness in the space of the terrible problems of Vietnam. The greatest accomplishment was doing what the president had asked us to do within the time frame that he asked us to. That was a heck of an achievement. We got tons of telegrams and letters after the flight. And I remember the one that sticks out in my mind more than any other was it said, Congratulations, Apollo 8. You saved 1968. Apollo 8 will go down in history as the first flight away from the Earth and to another body in the solar system, uh, our moon. Uh, it will go down in the technical history as the first flight on the Saturn V and setting the world speed record. I frankly think that Apollo 8 will be remembered more by the Earthrise picture 100 years from now, and the fact that this was our first uh, view of looking back uh, at the Earth from relatively deep space. And I said at the time, and uh, uh, it certainly affects me today, that I think it's ironic that we went all the way to the moon to explore the moon, and what we really discovered was the Earth. <laughs>